Um, next, we're going to have Michael Johnson talking about um, the Event Horizon Telescope and just interferometry in general a little bit. Um, and Michael Johnson is a um, astro uh, astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for um, Astrophysics. Um, he did his PhD um, at, at Santa Barbara, but he also um, was here for his undergrad at UC, uh, USC. So it's great to have him back <laughs> in Southern California. We have to keep him here. Um, but uh, so Michael um, is um, one of the leads for the imaging working group for the Event Horizon Telescope, but really kind of Michael has his fingers in basically every part of the project. So you, if you have any questions, I mean, there's lots of people here, but Michael is a great resource too. So anyway, with that, uh, let's thank Michael for coming back. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you, Katie. Um, and welcome, everyone. So out in the sky, tucked in between the uh, constellations of Virgo and Leo, is this giant elliptical galaxy called M87. So M87 is a huge galaxy, but it's about 55 million light years away. And what that means is that even with the best <coughs> optical telescopes in the world, all you can really see is a ball of stars with a faint jet extending from it. So here's an image uh, coming into view from, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now it turns out you can actually achieve higher angular resolution with radio interferometry. And so we're able to then see these, this prominent jet extending from the source. And as we push to higher and higher frequencies, the jet becomes more and more translucent. And we can look through all the way down to its heart when we finally get to this image, uh, which is the Event Horizon Telescope image at 1.3 millimeters. So what I'd like to tell you today is, you know, how did we actually produce this image? How, how did we achieve this resolution? And you know, what might we do next? What, what can we re really hope for? And to start with, you know, there are really two things you have to grapple with with this image, two sort of extremes that are, that are very hard to wrap our head around. And the first is just how big this black hole is. So to put this in context, if the Earth were compressed down to the size of a black hole, it'd be about an inch across. You could hold it on your finger. At many seven, for comparison, the black hole would extend beyond the orbit of Pluto. So this thing is an absolute monster. And you know, as we heard earlier, this is actually among the most massive black holes in the universe, as inferred from any method. So this is an absolute beast. Now the paradox is that even though we have this gigantic black hole, it's actually microscopically small on the sky. Okay, so the, uh, the, the angular size of the M87 black hole on the sky is about the same size as a donut sitting on the moon. Uh, or it's about, also about the same as an atom held at arm's length. And so this really requires a new type of telescope. You know, we saw we're, we're many orders of magnitude, or several at least, below uh, what, what something like Hubble can see. Uh, so how do we do that with interferometry? So to understand this, it turns out that we can uh, take some inspiration from ducks. Um, so here's some ducks. And uh, they run, they jump in a pond, and they start kicking their feet furiously. OK, so they're, they're kicking away, kicking away, and the water is stirred up and turbulent and irregular near the ducks. Uh, but if you look further away, you see that they, that leads to these outward propagating wave fronts, these nice coherent wave fronts over long scales. Uh, so again, near the ducts there, it's stirred up, turbulent, irregular, and further away, you can see these, these outward propagating wave fronts. Okay, so the toy problem that I want you to imagine is, suppose that you're there, standing on the edge of the pond, and your task is to tell me where the ducks are. But the trick is, you're blindfolded and you can't hear anything. So all you can do is you can sit on the edge of the pond, you feel the, the water lapping up and down against your feet. And the question is, does that, does that information, just this lapping of the water, does that tell you where the ducks are splashing? Uh, so let's simplify this a little bit more. Uh, here's our cartoon version of the problem. Uh, we'll do these two experiments. <coughs> on, on the left, we have ducks that are very close together in the pond, and on the right, we have ducks that are spread apart. So let's uh, do the ones on the left first. We'll let them start splashing away, Near the center, it's stirred up, uh, stirred up and irregular, and then you see these nice smooth outward propagating wave fronts. And again, I, I want you to imagine that you're standing on the, the boundary of this pond, and you're just feeling this water you know, slosh up and down. OK, let's run the second experiment now. We have these ducks that are further apart. They start kicking. Again, it's very similar. Near the center of the pond, it's uh, stirred up and, and irregular, and then we have these outward propagating wave fronts. And again, just imagine that you're standing there on the edge of the pond, feeling that water. So you can see that there are some differences here. Uh, the first thing, though, is the, the similarity. So if you look at just the amplitude of this sloshing pattern, it turns out it's the same in these two cases. 
So if you're standing there and all you know is how much the water is sloshing, that actually doesn't tell you anything about where the ducks are. That just tells you how many ducks there are in the pond. It tells you sort of the total power of their combined sloshing. However, suppose you have a friend and they're standing near you on the pond. And suppose that you're both feeling the sloshing pattern and you're able to compare that. Okay, so if you're standing very close to each other, maybe they're right next to you, you'll, you'll see the same pattern. And as they move away from you at some scale, you start to see different patterns. It, it decorrelates. And in this particular case, the decorrelation is what's different between ducks that are spaced close together and ducks that are far apart. And so this begins to tell you, you know, what is so special about interferometry. What we're after in this problem is measuring the correlation properties around the boundary of this pond. Now, this is a very whimsical example. Uh, it, may, it might seem kind of irrelevant, but it's actually very closely tied to the astro, uh, astrophysical case. So uh, for something like M87, we don't have ducks, but we do have electrons. And the, these electrons gyrate around mag magnetic field lines. And as they do so, they're sending out ripples of, of electromagnetic radiation uh, towards the telescopes on Earth. And we're not standing on the edge of the pond, but what we do have is we have these telescopes that we can space as far apart as possible, and they measure this incident rippling of electromagnetic field. They record that, and then after the fact, what we do is we form pairs of correlations between every pair of telescopes. And they're just comparing these ripples of the electromagnetic field and calculating how correlated those patterns are. And it turns out that that's enough information to then make an image of the source just like it's enough information in the pond case to tell where the ducks are splashing. So this is, uh, this is called synthesis imaging. This was pioneered by Martin Ryle, who actually won the Nobel Prize for it in 1974. Um, but what I'd like to do next is actually walk through the mathematics of this and actually uh, connect with exactly what is being measured and how we can use that to make a picture. So to understand this, imagine that we have a point source of emission that's right uh, at the origin and it's being observed by a pair of telescopes. Okay, so the first thing you have to understand is that astrophysical sources emit noise. Okay, this is a very strange concept, but, but they're actually emitting uh, just you know, raw Gaussian noise. However, since the path length to both telescopes is identical in this case, if you form the correlation between the electric fields that they measure, it's always going to be the same number. Uh, it, it just tells you the total intensity of the source. They're, they're receiving the exact same signals, okay? And so this, this, uh, this two-point function or correlation or whatever your particular discipline likes to call it, in interferometry, we refer to as an interferometric visibility. Uh, but it's a very, very simple quantity. So in this particular case, uh, the, 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 uh, the visibility measured is it's just going to be the total power emitted by the source, and that turns out to be independent of the baseline length, the separation between the telescopes. You can move them apart or move them together. They always see the same thing. It's very special. And one other side note is that they're, they're actually receiving this field. They're, they're sampling this Gaussian random field, and Gaussian random fields have this wonder, wonderful property that actually all of their information is contained in the two-point function. So it's not just that we're measuring this simple, uh, this simple quantity, it's actually that simple quantity tells us everything there is to know about the field. There's nothing else we can learn. Uh, so that, that turns out to be very powerful, as we'll see in a moment. Okay, now let's suppose that we take that source and we displace it, so we move it off the origin. Now in this case, the lengths to the two telescopes are no longer equal. And for, uh, for a propagating wave, that will introduce a phase uh, delay between the two telescopes. So it's pretty easy to show that the, 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 cha the difference in lengths between the telescopes is just that, that baseline between them times the angular displacement to the source. And so the equivalent phase delay is that we'll take our total power measurement uh, in the visibility, and then it gets multiplied by this, this factor e to the minus 2 pi i times u, which is the dimensionless baseline, just b, the b over lambda, uh, and then multiplied by theta, where theta is in radians. Okay, so a couple of properties from this is that we, um, first we see that this extra change to the visibility is entirely in the phase. Okay, so displacements on the sky are equivalent to phases in interferometric visibilities. Um, and that depends both on the baseline length and the displacement and the angular displacement. The second thing you'll notice is that the visibility amplitude is actually unaffected. Um, so it's the same as if it were uh, identified at the origin. If we want to measure any sort of astrometric properties, we have to have abs um, information about the absolute phase. 
The characteristic resolution in the interferometer can also be seen this, by this equation. So you can just look at when that, the argument, the, the exponential would be unity or two pi or something. And it tells you that the characteristic resolution of our interferometer is like something like one over u or uh, lambda over b. So this looks like just like a diffraction limit. Um, and then finally, you'll notice uh, we took a displacement orthogonal to the, you know, along the, the baseline direction. If we had moved the source uh, closer to, to the telescopes or further away or out of the plane of the page, the lengths to both telescopes would have been the same. So what this means is that baselines only see information that are uh, for displacements that are along their direction. Um, so another way to think of this is baselines live in line land. And uh, interferometric arrays see this two-dimensional source. They live in flat land. But poor baselines, you know, they only see one-dimensional information about sources. Uh, and so you, if you want to piece together information about a source, you can't just take one long baseline. You need baselines at lots of different orientations uh, to patch all that information together. So again, this, this seems like a pretty sanitized problem, but it's very easy to generalize. And that's because astrophysical sources are uh, spatially and temporally incoherent. And what this means is that if we have some extended distribution of flux density, any image we like on the sky, then we can just integrate that up and so we get this, uh, this relationship between the visibilities measured by an interferometer and the image on the sky. And this is known as the Van Zernike theorem. Now, uh, for those of you who have taken anything on Fourier analysis, you'll recognize that you know, the visibility in image relationship here is just a Fourier transform. And this turns out to be tremendously powerful. So the, what it's saying is that the visibilities measured by an interferometer are just the Fourier transform of the image on the sky. And that means every sort of nice property that you know for Fourier transforms has some corresponding uh, interpretation in terms of visibilities. Uh, a couple other properties you'll notice is, um, first of all, the visibility magnitude actually has to be maximum at, on a zero baseline. In the case of the pond, that's not surprising, right? You see the most correlated fluctuations around the boundary of the pond when, when your friend is standing right next to you. There's no way that it can become more correlated than that. And in this case, you can see that very easily from the integral. And that, that visibility magnitude will start to fall as baselines begin to resolve the source. Um, OK, so here are a couple of examples, uh, just toy models. Um, the solid line here is a Gaussian. So the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Uh, that's, that's a property that uh, is very familiar. Uh, well, one thing is that a big Gaussian in the image corresponds to a small Gaussian in the visibility domain. And that makes sense, right? Something big on the sky is easy to resolve. You don't need long baselines to resolve it. Something very compact on the sky requires extremely long baselines to resolve it. Um, so that's one very simple relationship. And it, it falls monotonically. Uh, however, these other sources, a disk or an optically thin sphere or a ring, they don't fall monotonically. They have additional structure on the long baselines. But what you'll notice is that to, to a short baseline, these all look pretty similar, right? It's not until you push to those long baselines that your interferometer can see the difference between all of these different sources. And so you can start to understand this idea of, you know, for an inter interferometer to distinguish between different, uh, different morphologies of sources, what you need is both long and short baselines in combination. OK, so this is roughly how an interferometer works. But still, why would anyone ever use an interferometer? What's the advantage? And there, it turns out to be really a story of angular resolution. So for ordinary imaging, resolution just depends on the diffraction limit, at least in, uh, in the ideal case. And we already saw that this is lambda over d. Uh, for, your, for your eyes, that's something like an arc minute. Uh, for a radio telescope, you know, a radio telescope can have a diameter of hundreds of meters. But radio wavelengths are so much longer than optical wavelengths that uh, the, the angular resolution of radio telescopes is about the same as your eyes. Um, however, optical telescopes can, of course, be much larger than your eyes and, and uses the same wavelength. So optical telescopes, as we saw, can get down to something like 50 milli arc seconds or so. Now, the magic of interferometry is that your angular resolution depends not on the size of any particular telescope, but on the distance between them. But this comes with a price, and that price is that you're, you're no longer forming images directly. So in an interferometer, every, uh, every baseline joining a pair of telescopes is just sampling one spatial frequency of your image. So one way to think about this is 
If the image were a song, then each bass line just hears a single note. So if you want to hear the entire song or see the whole image, what you need is many different bass lines, both long and short, lots of different orientations, and then you can piece all that information together to form an image. OK, so pulling it all together, this is the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, it's not a single telescope, but it's many telescopes all over the world acting together as an interferometric array. And these were all pre-existing submillimeter telescopes, and the, the Event Horizon Telescope project over decades uh, gradually brought them into, uh, in, uh, into the EHT to act as a, as a coherent array. And so this requires a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it, it requires precisely synchronizing them. Um, and that's because, again, astrophysical sources are emitting noise, which means if you're looking at signals that are delayed by a little bit, uh, you just see nothing. If you and your friend uh, aren't looking at the sloshing pattern at the same time, it doesn't do you any good. You can't compare your sloshing pattern today with theirs tomorrow. Right? And so these, all of these signals have to be precisely aligned, and uh, the EHT uses uh, uh, masers for that. In addition to that, um, at some millimeter wavelengths, telescopes can't be very big. And so we have to achieve sensitivity not just through large dishes, but also by requiring uh, recording very wide bandwidths. So we're looking at continuum sources, and, and we're just swallowing as many bits as we can and putting that towards uh, uh, improving the sensitivity of the array. So this is the first image from the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, that little circle in the lower right is the resolution of the telescope. It's 20 micro arc seconds or so. That's the point spread function or, or beam pattern or whatever you like. And so. We have this blurring image, not because we think that M87 is a blurry source, but uh, because we're really pushing our instrument to its absolute limit here. Um, and if we want to learn more about the source, then we have, to, uh, we have to continue to improve the array. So just to tie together this whole picture, this is a cartoon of how the EHT works. The signals come into these telescopes that record the coherent uh, um, electric field to disk. These disks are then all shipped to a central correlation facility which combines all the different pairs between the telescopes to calculate these correlations. They then have to be precisely aligned. Uh, and this is actually an alignment that, that brings them to consistency within femtoseconds. And then after uh, the calibration, uh, we, we pass this to imaging algorithms that try to take these, uh, just this handful of measurements in the Fourier domain and to reconstruct the corresponding image. Now, one thing you might be wondering is that uh, it doesn't seem like we, we sample very much in, uh, information. So it turns out in 2017, there were only five EHT sites that could see M87. And that corresponds to a measurement of 10 different frequencies. That's just not very much. How could you possibly form an image with only 10 frequencies? And there it turns out we have one more trick that we can play, and that's that we can make the Earth part of our instrument. Um, so here's an example. We have a pair of telescopes in the EHT here on the left and they have a baseline joining them. So on the right, what we have is we're just mapping that particular baseline uh, to, to where it lives in the frequency domain. Okay, so that's measuring a single frequency for us. However, as the Earth rotates, that projected baseline changes as a function of time. So actually that single physical baseline is sampling many different spatial frequencies of the source for us. And so what we do is we take the entire rotation of the Earth and we use it to build up information. So each physical baseline is actually sampling many different frequencies for us. We aggregate that over as many hours as we can, and then we turn all of that information into a single picture of the source. And that's how we get enough information to make images. So here's some actual data from the EHT. Uh, these are the types of plots that you'll, you'll see in our papers. On the left uh, is, is plotting signal to noise ratio of a uh, visibility measurement as a function of baseline length. Uh, so this might seem like kind of an odd thing to plot, but this is actually the thing that's natively measured by an interferometer. It's measured effectively perfectly. Now on the right is after we calibrate that, so we try to put that in physical units, uh, in this case Jansky, uh, which is a unit of flux density. And you see those properties we talked about earlier. Right, it's highest at the zero baseline, and then it falls off. That's telling us that our baselines are indeed resolving the source. They're, they're long enough to, uh, to see what the source is looking like. And you'll notice something very intriguing about this. It's not falling monotonically. We're not looking at just some featureless Gaussian blob on the sky. And in fact, this, uh, this looks an awful lot like the uh, visibility function for a thin ring. So we saw this type of plot 
many months before we ever tried making images. And even then, you know, we were really excited, not because we knew that it had to be a ring, but because we knew that there was structure here, right? We, we are looking at the detailed astrophysics of a complex source. Uh, however, to, to really develop confidence in this and understand uh, to what degree this thin ring might be true, we have to proceed to imaging. So I don't have t uh, time to go into details about, about imaging algorithms, but I, I just want to give you the flavor of it. So imaging algorithms uh, broadly are trying to take a sparse amount of data and st to determine the image that's consistent with those data that's most conservative. So it turns out for any data set, there are an infinite number of images that can fit those data perfectly. Uh, what we have to do is select from that infinite space of images and, and find representative ones that we think are very conservative. So maybe you want to find the, the image that has the most entropy uh, that's consistent with your data. Or maybe you have other metrics that you prefer to define what conservative means. Now in this particular case, what I'm showing is uh, if you take our data and you restrict it to a single baseline, uh, what's the image that you would produce with that single baseline? So if, you, if all you measure is the, the, the visibility on a single baseline, it basically just tells you how big the, the image has to be. We don't get any detailed information about a ring or anything like that. I, we basically just get a blob. Now, if we add another baseline, this one's along the same direction. So again, these poor baselines are in line land. They're not seeing the full uh, two-dimensional uh, source. They're just seeing information uh, that's projected along their baseline direction. So they get a little more and they can break it up into these two clumps. We can add another site. So now we add our, our data for the baselines to Hawaii and, and we start seeing much more interesting structure. So uh, we start to see the hints of this ring emerge, um, but still it's, it's rather irregular and you know, I don't think anyone bet their life on that. Uh, but we add our final site and this is Pico Valletta in Spain and all of a sudden we get this, uh, this beautiful final image of the ring. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's really striking in interferometry. interferometry. The, the amount of information we have goes like the square of the number of sites. And so it can really be, you know, the addition of a single site can dramatically change what you're able to conclude and study from an image. So uh, this is a picture of the, 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 the first time that we ever produced this image uh, within the EHT. And I just want to bring this up because a lot of the things we're talking about today, including interferometry, uh, is really just an incremental uh, step forward of decades of work that's gone into this, you know, steadily marching to higher frequencies or, or adding more and more sites. Um, but this is not all a very old sort of well-defined field. Uh, a lot of the techniques that are being used in the EHT are being, you know, developed as we go, often by very young people. Uh, so just as an example, here are our three final images of M87. And for these, we use three different software packages. One of them is DiffMap. This is kind of the workhorse of the VLBI community and it's been around for decades. And this was actually developed at Caltech. Uh, but the other two were written from scratch, both by graduate students. So Andrew Shale uh, wrote one of them called EHT Imaging. I, I don't, he, he's not here, but uh, Kazu Akiyama um, wrote the other one. And, and they both uh, started this when they were graduate students. In addition to that, we had to, to produce these images, we had to run these massive parameter surveys generating hundreds of thousands of images to, to select which ones were the most reliable. And D Daniel Palumbo is a graduate student who ran those. Uh, Lindy Blackburn directed the data processing and calibration. He's here as well. Uh, Katie Bowman, our, our host, uh, led the synthetic data and blind testing design and, and was just key to everything we did in the imaging working group. Uh, so really, this is, this is a field where there are, there are a lot of fresh ideas and it's something that I, you know, I hope at this workshop we'll continue to push and understand what can uh, what can be done to continue to improve it. So we have these images, they're, um, they're great, but what's next? Uh, well, the first thing is we don't think that M87 looks like that. We think it looks like these, uh, these beautiful images and movies that Charles was showing. So these GRMHD simulations reveal some, some key differences from the images that we have. You know, first, there's all sort of small scale structure in the image. And the second is that they're intensely variable. So in this particular simulation of M87, one second corresponds to about two weeks in real time. So these are actually sources that we can study on, on reasonable time scales. You know, as Charles said, GM over C cubed is eight or nine hours. Uh, so these things are evolving fast enough that we can really study them in real time. So what can be done? How can we build an array that will get us to the, these higher resolutions, both in, uh, in, in angular scales and in time? 
Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that the EHT is already pushing forward. So it's, it's been continuously developing over the last decade, and, and it's still really progressing quite rapidly. So in 2017, that was the year that led to this data that, that allowed us to make these first images. And, and that was key because uh, we added ALMA to the array, this, this whole collection of telescopes in Chile. Uh, and that, that increased our sensitivity enormously. But in addition, we were, we were using LMT, uh, this telescope in, in Mexico, and Pico Valletta and at the South Pole, all together as, as an array for the first time, really. Uh, in 2018, so this is unpublished data, but it's a campaign that's already happened, we added the Greenland telescope. It turns out Greenland is a, a wonderful location to observe M87. Uh, it's, it's really ideal for improving the quality of our M87 images. But not just that, we actually doubled our recording rate. So we're collecting twice as many bits, and that improves our sensitivity by the square root of two, as well as giving us more information about things like polarization. In 2020, we have a really exciting campaign planned that uh, we're hoping will add two new sites. One is at Kitt Peak in Arizona, and the other is Noama, uh, which is an array in France. And in addition to that, we're going to start exploring more and more tests at 345 gigahertz. So these are 50% better resolution. And of course, the, the frequencies coverage is now getting so wide that we can really study new types of uh, physical effects through the frequencies. Um, but here you can see the, the recording rates here have just been, uh, they've been growing exponentially. And, and I think this is why it's, it's such an exciting thing to think about how we should prioritize efforts as we move forward in the EHT. There's really the capability for, for s dramatic increases in capabilities. Um, both in terms of the hardware and in terms of you know, con connecting with uh, new scientific ideas. So what might we expect in the very near term? You know, the first is, we, we have this ring, but where's the jet? Right? Ev on that zoom in movie at the beginning, all the other radio frequency arrays see a jet, every single one, until you get to the EHT and it vanishes. Uh, so here's an example. This is a very high resolution image at seven millimeters. Um, and this is produced using data from the Very Long Baseline Array. And one thing we've done here is we've actually taken about eight months of data, and we've stitched it together to make movies. This is something that uh, Katie and I have been doing a lot of work on. And the beautiful thing here is you see that M87 is really alive, uh, right? The system is, is ejecting material. There, there's all sorts of dynamics. And these are anchored to the black hole itself. So if we can connect to the jet in EHT images, we can start to understand the role of the, the black hole in, in producing and powering this jet, just as Charles was discussing. So why don't we see this in EHT images? Well, one thing is that the dynamic range of the seven millimeter image that I'm showing is about 10,000. The dynamic range of the EHT image is about 10. Uh, so we, ha we have a long ways to go before we can, we can match this dynamic range. And, and we think that there is this faint jet in EHT images that's just waiting to be seen. Now, a big part of the problem that we don't see it is we actually have a uh, resolution that's too high. So if you want to see diffuse extended emission, you need short baselines. And that's something that we just don't have right now. So here's an example of, uh, of one mission concept uh, that, that we're considering right now. And that would be to add a bunch of small dishes around the world to add short baselines and to be able to maybe, maybe uh, get this extended emission and, and be able to connect to the jet very well. And the nice thing about short baselines is there's more flux on them. They don't have to be as sensitive. So what we're exploring is maybe adding six meter dishes to the EHT array and putting them in sites that are really suboptimal. You know, they're not, they wouldn't be prime candidate sites for, for a submillimeter array or something like that. Uh, but, but maybe they're exactly what's needed by the EHT. So this is something that I, I hope we can discuss this week. Uh, and I'll uh, direct you to this, uh, this white paper led by uh, Lindy Blackburn and Shep Dolman. Um, that kind of lays out the case and, and some of the tests that we've done so far on that. Now, the other thing that we can think about is going to space. So from the ground, we're really approaching fundamental limits. You know, the, the most obvious one is you can't make baselines longer, <laughs> you know, uh, lar larger than the diameter of the Earth. Uh, so we're always going to be limited to that. Uh, but in addition to that, the Earth's atmosphere becomes increasingly problematic as you go to higher frequencies. So above a few hundred gigahertz, which is roughly where the EHT observes, uh, it becomes opaque. Now, there are some sites where you can observe up to, say, a terahertz, but it's going to get harder and harder, A, to have enough sites that you, you have enough baselines that you can actually form images, and B, to, to do observations when they all happen to have good weather at the same time. This is a really severe problem for us. 
Uh, in addition to that, suppose that we could create better images at 230 gigahertz. It turns out for uh, our galactic center, there's also this effect of interstellar scattering, and that's blurring out the source to roughly the beam size of the EHT. So what, it's, what that says is that even if we could make higher resolu resolution images, something in nature is preventing us from having a sharper view of the source. We have to find a way around that. So it turns out space baselines would uh, solve all of these problems. So first of all, at higher frequencies, we get higher uh, image resolution. And um, at higher frequencies, the scattering also becomes much, much weaker. It falls like wavelength squared. The next thing is that with space, we can, of course, make baselines as long as we want. Uh, we can go to the moon or to L2 and, and increase uh, over what we can do from the ground by, by many orders of magnitude. Um, and another nice thing about going to space is that there's the potential to do faster sampling of baselines. So we have, this, we have this method where we aggregate data over a whole night of observations. And that's basically limited by the rotation speed of the Earth. But one thing we can do is we could use low Earth orbiters. And these are orbiting on 90-minute time scales. So those very quickly fill in the UV plane and might give us sensitivity to more rapidly changing intrinsic structures. Uh, so there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of exciting possibilities for space. And it's really dependent on the different orbital uh, configurations that are, that are being assessed. There are, of course, many challenges in going to space. One is uh, sensitivity. So we're, we're already kind of at the sensitivity, you know, we're, we're kind of at the, the sensitivity limits of the current EHT. If you go to space, uh, it's, it's, of course, very difficult to launch large dishes. Uh, in addition to that, very wide recorded bandwidths. You have to think of some way of getting all that data back down to Earth to be correlated. And you have to worry about uh, coherence times. So the, the orbiters can move so fast that you actually uh, you have to worry about smearing out different sampling in the UV plane. Uh, so there are some new uh, uh, restrictions that come into play. In addition to that, we, we have to understand how well the orbital modeling and stability uh, uh, can be done for an, for an orbiter and whether or not the there's going to be fundamental limits on the phase stability that, that affect how you can average. And, and of course, the, the main driver uh, and, and limitation of a space mission will be, uh, will be the cost. Uh, so lots to discuss. Um, I wanted to close by just saying the EHT results are the, the work of a huge collaboration. Uh, this is you know, over 300 people and, and, and many more who uh, contributed to building this instrument over the past few decades. Uh, many of them are in this room, and, and uh, you know, we're all very eager to share these results with you and answer any questions you have. So thank you.